It is Tuesday, April 30th. This is the Christian Commute. I'm your host, Seth Dunn. We're off to a rough start already because I forgot my sunglasses. It's bright outside. It's also hot. And you're with me. You're riding with me, I should say, on the way home. But I won't be there for long because I have to pick up my kids for baseball. So we got playoff baseball, practice, soccer practice, and then a long night of making up the time because I'll have to get back to work as soon as I get home from all this uh, baseball practice and soccer practice stuff. I have a full show for you today because someone submitted a question. And I'm sleepy, so I don't know why I'm so sleepy. But I am, so it's going to be one of those shows where I yawn a lot. And uh, I'll tell you this. I, it didn't help that I listened to a couple of old podcasts today in my office. Because I'm restarting this uh, Baptist Faith and Message article series. And listening to myself puts me to sleep. I had to turn it off before I fell asleep in my office. So that's today's show title is Article 10, The Kingdom. That Where I left off last time in the Baptist Faith and Message series was, I think, Article... Wait, no, I'm in Article 9, The Kingdom. Sorry. I left off in Article 8, The Lord's Day, which just happens to be what today's question in the inbox is about. So if you go to christiancommute.podomatic.com, and I think christiancommute.com will take you to the same place, and you search through my episodes, if you, if you just search for the title of the episode, Article 8, you'll find a commentary on the Sabbath, because today's question is about the Sabbath. So you can listen to that. I'm still going to answer the question. I've, I've talked about this or answered some variant of this question plenty of times. A question about the Sabbath. Uh, and that question, well, I'll tell you what it is when I get there. That's, a, that's called a tease in the business. you got to wait. you got to listen to find out exactly what the question is. But I have a question on the Sabbath. After we do the show title, which is Article 9, The Kingdom, once again, continuing in the series of the Baptist Faith and Message, I went all the way through the first eight articles, but I started talking about other stuff, and I haven't come back to it until now. I was listening to one of them uh, earlier today, and I I had just started this job. I think one of them, one of my kids might not even have been born yet, so this this is an old series. But before we get to that, first and foremost, as always, is the Bible chapter review. Well, I'll try to do I'll try to do it with the same enthusiasm that Mary had when she was when she was reciting her poem here. Luke chapter 1 verses 46 through 49. This is part 1 of the Magnificent or what's called the Magnificent, which is a poem of praise or a prayer of praise uh, that Mary gave. So she's come to visit Elizabeth. Elizabeth is very excited to see her. John the Baptist in the womb leaps with joy being in the presence of the mother of the Messiah. Elizabeth feels blessed to have met the mother of her Lord in in the person of her relative Mary. And then Mary has a poetic exaltation of God and we'll, we're going to do this in parts because it it's long and I wanted to make sure I you know, got it in the sticky note in its poetic form so Mary is going to reference by the way some scripture in what we call the Magnificent and if you google that it will tell you Magnificent just means it's magnifying God is what that means it's a Latin term. And this is where we say Mary has no special powers to the Roman Catholic listeners. But this is what Mary says, starting in verse 46. And Mary said, 
My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit. Oh my gosh, how embarrassing. I can't read my writing. Let me start again. This is the most famous, this is like one of the most famous prayers of all time. Arguably, I should have it memorized, but let me try again. Give me a, give me a do over because I yawned. And I had to write small to fit it. And Mary said, My soul exalts in the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. We see in this our familiar pattern of parallel poetry, parallelism. My soul exalts in the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Basically saying the same thing in different ways. Mary is very happy about her situation. She exalts the Lord from her innermost being, her soul, Soul and spirit imply the same thing here. Just the metaphysical part of you. Or part of Mary as the case may be. And my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. God is her Savior. She's bearing the Savior, by, by the way. The Messiah, Yeshua, Joshua, Jesus. He's a Savior. And Mary gets to play a part in this by bearing Jesus. And she's rejoicing in God her Savior. And then she talks about how the Lord has consideration for the humble. He has regard for the humble state of his bond slave. Mary knows that she's not anyone particularly special in the grand scheme of things as compared to anybody else, except for the, the, the new detail here that she's going to bear Jesus. She's just another teenage girl. We think she's a teenager. She's just another common teenage girl. Now, by the way, when I say common, I just mean, you know, she's not, she doesn't appear to be wealthy or well-to-do. We know this from the rest of Scripture. Her husband is a simple carpenter, which would have been what we call in modern times a stonemason. So her, her husband make, makes bricks and builds things out of bricks. He's a builder, carpenter. Uh, they don't. They don't even have a nice place to stay when they go to be taxed. There's no room for them at the end. Let me tell you, when you're rich, there's always room for you at the end. <laughs> okay, so she's a humble person. She is in the line of David. However, let's not. Lose. She's common. Well, she's in the line of David. That's a big deal. But she's just another one of the Lord's bond slaves. Who is she to bear the Messiah? Well, she rejoices in that it has been chosen for her to do so. She's found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And she realizes that from that time on, everyone's going to call her blessed. All generations going forward are going to call her blessed. And to this day, we remember this prayer, and we remember this part of Scripture, and Mary's attitude of thanksgiving and joy, and how she found favor in the Lord, and she was blessed. And we're all blessed through Jesus who she bore for us as part of God's plan. Going all the way back to the beginning. Not just with Abraham, but even before that. And Mary says, For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name. She's humble, but a bond slave. But God is the Mighty One. The Mighty One has remembered her, and holy is His name. And with that, we'll end the Bible chapter review. Now let's move on to the inbox. Do you, if, if, if I didn't put you to sleep yet, if you're still awake, do you have questions? Or a question? I'll just take one. I just need one. Do you have a question? about Christian theology or apologetics write to sethdunn88 at gmail.com tell me your question in a succinct manner 
and tell me where you're from. It's got to be short enough for me to memorize. Or you can dial 470-315-0875. 470-315-0875. The Christian Commute is your theological roadside assistance. I'll also take this time while asking you for things, to ask you for money. Don't forget to support the Y Project so I can do targeted Facebook ads for YCrossPoint.com, Y yrockbridge.com and eventually yelevation.com which is the next one I'm working on. I think my next ad campaign is going to go after a satellite location. A satellite location. I haven't decided which one yet but I'm going to do some Facebook ads. I had a listener send me some money over the weekend. Thank you for that money listener. And it was, it was told to me that some of my older listeners may not be able to find me on Venmo or PayPal or Patreon. So if you go to whycrosspoint.com, I'm not sure if it's up yet at whyrockbridge.com. I know it's not up yet at uh, whyelevation.com. There's a page where you can click to give, and I think it has those options. But I need to remember to start including those links, like my Venmo link and my PayPal link, in the podcast description itself. Maybe I'll remember to do that this week. And I don't usually think to do this because it's not one of those fundraising podcasts. Well, you got to thank you all for your support. Make sure you give to your church first and whatever's left over, you can give to our work. And if you give, I'll send you a free book. But it's not really free because you paid me money first to get the free book and we can't do it without you and blah, 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 blah. I can absolutely afford for the podcast fee with it's $600 a year. I really appreciate the people who do send in money to help me pay for it, but I can do it. But for other things, like the Y Project, that's, that's its own thing. I do need some help with that, or I would like some help with that, because it can be as big... Is it's going to be? We already know the billboard got noticed. We already know the billboard got noticed. And all the people who are mad about it, it's not as effective as the social media. And like I told my Sunday school teacher, when he wanted me to take down the billboard, which, by the way, the billboard's down. I only bought it for a month. That's called a flight. I just had it for Easter time. When he said, you know, you should stop doing it. And I just looked at him and I said, I'm going to make more websites. You don't like it, Mr. XYZ Baptist Church man out there? You don't like YCrossPoint.com? You don't like YElevation.com? Too bad, because I'm just going to make more. And it's going to be to the shame of everyone who pumps elevation music and hillsong music and Bethel music into a sanctuary they call God's and fill it up with the purple haze. I don't care if you don't like how it looks. It's going to look like people are getting Facebook notifications to actually think about what they're exposing their family to and their kids to on Sunday morning. What they're teaching them that church is. So don't forget to donate to the Y Project. Faceless, nameless elders everywhere. Taking phone calls do not approve of this message. All right. Well, my phone's going off. Let me kill my alarm. I had to set my alarm to remind me to leave work. Because I get so excited and so ensconced about my spreadsheets that I don't know that, that the time passes. I ain't looking to punch a clock at five if I'm making a report. Anybody ever play Call of Duty before? I used to play Call of Duty before I had kids on PlayStation. You sit down to play Call of Duty online, each session takes ten minutes. And then two hours later, like what happened? I'm, I'm hungry and it's dark outside. 
That's how I am if you get me on a spreadsheet. So I had to set an alarm to remind myself to go to baseball. This question is a follow-up question from Philip D. Glass in Texas. He goes, all right, this is what I meant to ask. Should Christians consider Saturday as the Sabbath? Yes. We can't redesign what the days are that's baked into creation. There's a short answer for you. Okay? In six days, God made the world. On the seventh day, he rested and set it apart as the Sabbath. The Sabbath is Saturday because Saturday is the seventh day of the week. Sunday is the first. Saturday is the, 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 the seventh. That's just, it is what it is. You can't change it to Thursday or Tuesday or Sunday. That's the Sabbath day. It just The Sabbath is just the seventh day. By its nature, the Sabbath is the seventh day. It always will be because that's baked into creation itself. Now, as far as what you're supposed to do or not do on the Sabbath is a different question. Now, if you're talking about when you say in your question, if you're talking about consideration, if by consider the Sabbath, you mean classify as the Sabbath, then yes, Saturday is the Sabbath. Christians and everybody in the whole world should consider Saturday the Sabbath. But if you're saying the consideration that you give a day in order to having set it apart, should Christians consider the Saturday the Sabbath if they want to? Like it says in Romans, one man considers one day above another, and vice versa, okay? What we call the Lord's Day is also called the Christian Sabbath. In church history, the very part of the early church in the New Testament, because Jesus rose on Sunday, that's when we started having church, Sunday, church services on Sunday. Instead of meeting in, on Saturday for synagogue like they used to. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. We have entered his rest. Period. Okay? We've entered his rest. Remember what Jesus said. Is man made for the Sabbath or is the Sabbath made for man? Remember what he said when they were complaining about him. Or his disciples picking the heads off of grain on the Sabbath. Right. Do we have to set apart Saturday as the official day we rest from our labors and go to church? No, we can do it on Sunday. We can do it on Tuesday if we want to. That's a decision that you're making with your church, your local church. 99.999999% of us seem to have done it on Sunday. Okay? So, and, and, and I want you to think about this, how we view weeks. Sunday is the official first day of the week, right? But what do we call Saturday and Sunday? We call it the weekend. And I bet if you work at a factory, your payroll period, at least if you work at a factory here, your payroll period starts on Monday. It goes Monday through Sunday for your payroll period. So if you work, you know, 45 hours from that time, not Sunday through Saturday, but Monday through Sunday. They're calculating your overtime based on that. From a standpoint of how we labor and do business in, in the culture in which I live, Monday is really treated as the first day of the week. And we... And you saw, there's two days on the weekend. The weekend is the end of the week. And we say Sunday is the second day of the weekend. They all, we don't work. People don't work on Saturday and Sunday, right? Typically, nine to fivers like me don't work on Saturday and Sunday unless we've got just something to do. Every once in a while, I'll work on Saturday. My boss asked me to work on Sunday. It was really important. It was during budget time. She said, I need you to do this. I said, okay, I'll do it. I told her I'd do it at sundown. I, I, I don't know if I said sundown. I'll get to it. And I was like, all right, Jewish day ends at sundown. I'm not working till the Jewish day's over, at least. Call me legalistic. 
but I didn't want to work on Sunday. So if you're setting apart a day of the week to rest, which by the way, I've said on this show before, you should, because it's baked into creation, okay? Don't put a bunch of rules on it, like, well, I can't go to the ball game or I can't mow my yard, because as I've said before, my job is not yard mower. My job is director of financial planning and analytics. I'm, I'm, that's what I do for a living. Riding around on my riding mower does not feel laborious to me. It's just the time I have to do something. You may disagree with that. You may say, I don't even want to cook on Sunday. Okay, fine. Just make sure you go to church. And make sure you're not prioritizing work over church. I don't care what day you do it on. And I don't think the biblical authors inspired by the Holy Spirit cared. But just to reiterate, plainly and simply, yeah, of course Saturday is the Sabbath. Because it's the seventh day of the week. It is what it is. What you do on your day of rest is what you do on your day of rest. And if necessary, you might have to move it from week to week. That's what Stonewall Jackson did. If they had to march on Sunday, he'd make another Sabbath day during the week so his troops recognized the Sabbath. And that's what they they called it, a Sabbath or the Sabbath. In in the Old South, it's the Sabbath, sir. They'd be referring to Sunday. It's Christian Sabbath is Sunday. But the Sabbath is Saturday. Shabbat, what's that? It's resting. We need to rest. And Jesus is our Sabbath rest. So I hope that clears things up for you or answers your question, um, Philip. And remember, Philip's thinking about this in terms of these Judaizer cults, like Hebrew roots, or even Seventh-day Adventist is a bit of a Judaizer cult. If you meet somebody who's a Seventh-day Adventist, don't count them like a fellow evangelical. It's not like meeting a PCA person or a global Methodist or a Church of God person. Like, no. Like, no, no, no. Treat them as a mission field. If you did not hear me list your type of church, you're probably the mission field. Although I wasn't, you know, I wasn't exhaustive. Uh, What do you got? You got the uh, Free Church, Evangelical Free Church. You got the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, Independent Fundamentalist Baptists. Even some coffee goat show churches probably have people who are saved. Okay? Seventh day Adventist is a Judaizing cult. And you got to be able to answer, ready to recognize their thing because Sabbath day is their thing. That's what they're going to point out that you're doing wrong. Same thing with the Hebrew Roots movement. That's what they're going to say you're doing wrong and why your church is false. And they're just like, dude, I'm going to church one day a week. I'm resting from my labor one day a week. You're going to pick on that I'm doing it on Sunday? Give me a break. You don't get it. Just like the Pharisees didn't get it when Jesus was talking to them. Gosh, it's what Judaizing and legalism is, man. Ugh. Ugh. You, you hear me? Ugh. That's how I talk about legalism. And you guys, if you can find a more judgmental person than I am, I, I defy you to find somebody more judgmental in in evangelical podcast world. All right? I am critical of everything. And even I'm like, oh, I'm disgusted by Judaizing and legalism. <laughs> Promise you will find no one more critical or judgmental than I am. It's a, it's a neurological abnormality with me. You have to find some other autistic theologian with a podcast who's worse than I am. All right. Let's go to Article 9 of the Baptist Faith and Message. There are 18 articles of the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. Do you and your church members know them all? It's okay if you don't know them by heart. It's not like in the the Crucible, in the Salem Witch Trials, where they're going to put you to death if you can't name all the Ten Commandments. Okay. You don't have to name all. You don't have to have all the Ten Commandments memorized to be a church member. Although it's not that hard if you just think through them. You don't have to have all 18 articles of the Baptist Faith and Message memorized. But listen, if you're a church member at a Baptist church, 
you really need to believe these. I want to tell you this. If you have people at your church who don't believe these, get rid of them. Don't just be like, you don't believe them, you're gone. Be like, teach them. And be like, okay, I get it now. But if they say, like, no, I deny that, get rid of them. Let them go to a church that believes the wrong thing. What I mentioned the other day that these churches, they have their new members classes or discover the church classes. And it's an hour long. And it's like, you ask yourself, are you going over all 18 articles of the Baptist Faith and Message? Because I think it takes more than an hour. Or are you telling people that you got a teen program, a middle school program, and, you know, Wednesday night activities? Church is not just about what you do, it's about what you believe. Or what the church believes. That's why it's so important to go through these articles. So let's talk about Article 10, the Kingdom of God. Now, according to Article 10, which is supposedly backed up by the Bible, you can go look up the scriptural references under each article in the Baptist Faith and Message. Just Google it, Baptist Faith and Message 2000. The Kingdom of God includes or refers to the general sovereignty of God over all the universe. So God is sovereign. This is His world. He owns the cattle of a thousand hills. There's nothing and no one that does not ultimately, in some sense, belong to God. He has control over it. Ultimate sovereignty. That's talking about the creation. The kingdom also refers to the particular kingship of God over those, but the, the, the Baptist faith and message says, who willfully believe in him or recognize him as king. All right? So remember, the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that means all of them. Not the Calvinist all, which doesn't mean everybody. All of them, every single human being on earth who has lived and will ever live. Every knee shall bow and admit that Jesus Christ is Lord. And by the way, that's not making that's not them making a confession of faith Sunday after invitation time. That's not them getting saved. It doesn't mean that they believe in God now they're going to go to heaven. That's not the context and sense of that. It means there's a judgment coming. It means there's a consummation of all things coming. And the enemies of God, the people of the kingdom of darkness who are contrasted from the kingdom of light, they're going to recognize God as king. They don't recognize the kingship of God or the kingship specifically of Jesus Christ right now. There's two kingdoms. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. They're under Satan's power. They deny God. Even the Jews who reject Jesus ultimately deny the kingship of God because they've rejected his Messiah. So we talk about the kingdom, that's all the Christians. The universal church, the invisible church. We are recognizing, we, those of us who are in the kingdom, recognize and submit willfully to the kingships of God. Like, our knee is already bowed. Our tongue has already confessed. We don't need the great white throne and the judgment of God to do it for us. We've already humbled ourselves before the Lord. That's why we belong to Him. And you can think of it like this, uh, of a kingdom. Think of King George III's kingdom. Well, at one time, it included what we now call the United States, the 13 colonies. He was the king... And there were subjects there who recognized him as the king, but there were other subjects who did not. And he lost that part of his kingdom. That's not how it's going to work with God. He's king whether you acknowledge him or not, but you're outside of the kingdom of his people if you don't have that acknowledgement. Now, what are we kingdom workers to do? We people who are in the kingdom willfully submitted to the will of God and the kingship of God, recognizing who He is. 
We need to prayerfully labor. What do we do? We pray, we pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, as it is uh, on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. That's another witch trial thing you weren't supposed to be able to do. Say the Lord's Prayer. What a bunch of superstition. But I want to ask yourself, would you survive a, a rich trial? Can you even name the Ten Commandments and then do the Lord's Prayer? Come on. Come on. So we pray and we labor. We have work to do. I'll be somewhere a-working. I'll be somewhere a-working. I'll be somewhere a-working for my Lord. All right? The work is the Great Commission. The harvest is plentiful, plentiful but the workers are what? Few. And those of us few in the kingdom... We need to be doing the kingdom work of evangelism, baptism, and discipleship. And what do we also do? We wait. We are waiting for the ultimate eschatological consummation, the end. The judgment is coming. There will be a time when everybody left is a kingdom member who willfully acknowledges the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes and ends everything, everybody else is going to hell. And it will be just us with him in the New Jerusalem. That's the kingdom of God. Article 10 of the Baptist Faith and Message. Do you have a good idea and a good understanding of what the kingdom of God is. How you're a part of the kingdom within creation. It's like there's this little kingdom of God full of all the Christians included in a greater kingdom of God that includes non-Christians, but God's in control of that too. He's sovereign. If you watched the Braves 20, 25 years ago like I did, you will remember that Keith Lockhart's walk-up music was God is in control. God is in control. God was in control of Keith Lockhart's 275 batting average. Just like he's in control of everything else. Alright, that's it. That does it for today. Article 10. I'm sorry, Article 9. The kingdom's pretty short. I guess uh, Thursday, let's move on to Article, Article 10. It's the last things last things so it's a great transition there talking about the kingdom kingdom come for you I wait to kingdom come that's not about Jesus by the way that's a Coldplay song for you I'd wait to kingdom come until my time on earth is done say you'll wait you'll wait for me that's basically what all the Hillsongish people try to sound like Coldplay now I'm going to end the show. Maybe I'll listen to that Coldplay song. Thanks for listening to The Christian Commute. As always, God bless. And as always, remember, Christianity is not about getting saved. It's about being saved.